Good morning. Welcome to the live streaming worship service of the Universalist Unitarian Church of Riverside. I am Bonnie McFarland and I'm a member of the worship committee and I will be your worship associate today. We invite you to worship with us with an open mind and an open heart. As we enter into sacred time, created by our presence and shared intent, I invite you to get comfortable, turn down your phones or other distracting devices, make a conscious decision to set aside for this one hour, the self-protective walls we all keep around our hearts and our thoughts. Let us remember and explore together what has drawn us to this faith or learn what this faith is about and relax. Let the stresses of the outside world slip away as together we focus on this time together. And together we breathe. Although we are now a community connected largely by electronic means, one day we will be together again. Yet even now we are those seekers with the yearnings to learn, to understand, to make the world a better place. And with the same desire for fellowship. And so we are here seeking that living interconnected web of which we are a part. Let go of the anxiety, the fears, the expectations of your own or others making and join us in this hour of beloved community. And so together we breathe. Our opening hymn this morning is, There is more love somewhere. Please rise in spirit and join us. And because we are Zooming this, nobody will know if you sing off key. There is more love somewhere. There is more love somewhere. I'm going to keep on till I find it. There is more love somewhere. For a call to worship, I invite you to read with me this Unitarian Universalist Affirmation of Hope by Dr. Loretta Williams. We, bearers of the dream, affirm that a new vision of hope is emerging. 
we pledge to work for that community in which justice will be actively present. We affirm that there is struggle yet ahead, yet we know that in the struggle, there is hope for the future. We affirm that we are co-creators of the future, not passive pawns. And we stand united in affirmation of our hope and vision of a just and inclusive society. We affirm the unity of all persons. We affirm brotherhood and sisterhood that allows us to touch upon each other's humanity. We affirm a unity that opens our eyes, ears, and hearts to see the different but common forms of oppression, suffering, and pain. Yet we are one in the image of God, and we celebrate our hopes for human unity. Within ourselves and within the gathered community, we will discover the strength not to hide in indifference. <clears throat> Affirming that hope, publicly expressed, energizes and enables us to move forward. Together we pledge action to transcend barriers, be they racial, political, economic, social, or religious. We pledge to make our tomorrows become our todays. This morning, Kathy Nichols will be speaking and the title of her sermon is Invitation to a Treehouse. About the service, Kathy said, Invitation to a Treehouse is an exploration of compassion through the retelling of a personal experience. An example of generosity and an expression of compassion shown to me from a source most people would consider unlikely. So what is compassion? What do sage minds say about compassion? Why is it important? Kathy Nichols is no stranger to UUCR. She has usually been with us in a supportive role as the other half of Joan and Kathy. But today, she is the one behind the pulpit. Kathy holds a bachelor's degree in art and music history from Syracuse University and a master's of public administration in urban and community planning. She is currently living in Worcester, Massachusetts with Joan de Artemis, her, her partner of 27 years. There are a few announcements we would like to share. During the service, we will mention several websites and email addresses and phone numbers. At the end of the service, we will leave up a slide with all the information, and it is also available on our website. However, for those needing the information by auditory means, they will be announced verbally during the service. Chat time provides an opportunity to spend an hour talking among ourselves, usually beginning with the service, then wandering on to other topics. It's held on Zoom at 1130, but to participate, you need a separate Zoom link. So please go to our website at uuchurchofriverside.org for the Zoom chat time link. Camp de Beneville Pines is a wonderful place for camping events and retreats owned by the congregations and fellowships of the Pacific Southwest District of the Universalist Unitarian Association. It is at an elevation of 6,800 feet, just off of Highway 38 on the way up to Big Bear. Like the rest of the world, they have been affected by the COVID-19 pand pandemic, but they've also had to deal with the after effects of the El Dorado fire and subsequent damage from rain and flooding. Initial estimates are around $250,000. The, 
The initial COVID-19 emergency fund drive has thus been renamed the 2020-2021 emergency fund drive. They are applying for grant funds to help offset the costs of erosion and flood mitigation. Periodically, they look for volunteers to help with various tasks and those from our congregation who have answered the call have reported enjoying this the escape to the mountains, but most importantly, they felt they were doing something of value. Unfortunately, it's uncertain when they will be able to reopen, but when they do, we really want them to be there and be ready and ready for us to return. To learn more, go to uucamp.org. That's an easy one to remember. On Friday evening, California certified its election results, officially conferring their 55 electoral votes for President-elect Joe Biden. This gives him 279 pledged electors, nine over the, over the 270 threshold required to win the election. Three more states won by Biden, Colorado, Hawaii, and New Jersey are scheduled to certify their results in the next few days, giving President-elect Biden 306 electoral college votes. The electors in each state will meet December 14th to formally vote to, for the next president. Most states have laws binding their electors to the winner of the popular vote in their state measures that were upheld by the Supreme Court decision this year. The votes will then be tallied in a January 6 joint session of Congress. The inauguration will be January 20, 20th and will be nearly entirely, entirely virtual. And I am so very eager for all of this to be over and I bet you are too. But the country and even families have been so divided into right and left camps that the work is really just beginning for UUs. So what are other UUs doing? Lots of UUs are determined not to be lulled back into a stupor for four years. UU The Vote is part of the UU Justice Ministry of California. You can go to uujmca.org. They have many different programs, actions, and trainings going on all year. UUJMCA is also part of CUUSAN, which is what you see on the screen right now. That stands for Coalition of UU State Action Networks. Worried about the pandemic? pandemic, environment, immigration, social justice issues? Think our future is worth it? It's up, it's up to each and every one of us. They have workshops, trainings, actions, all kinds of activities. Check them out. Our Social and Environmental Justice Committee will not be meeting today, but will be scheduled to meet on the third Sunday of this month, which is December 20th at 1 p.m. Adam, the chair, said to watch your email for updates. For Zoom link, go to the church website and click on the justice menu, then click on social and environmental justice. On October 20th, Riverside County moved back into the more restrictive tier one widespread or purple tier of the governor's four tier plan. That means churches along with many other businesses and organizations must shut down indoor operations. We will continue to keep you updated on Sunday announcements and on the website. On December 3rd, a regional stay home order went into 
to affect for regions with less than 15% intensive care unit availability, ICU availability. Southern California is at 12.5% ICU availability. The regional stay at home order or RSHO will go into effect at midnight tonight, Sunday, December 6th, and will remain in effect for at least three weeks. After that period, it will be reassessed weekly and lifted when the region's projected ICU capacity meets or exceeds 15%. More details to come. Essentially, it all comes down to wear a mask and socially distance. Why is that so hard? For the most current and reliable information, go to the website for your county public health department or the state of California. You can also find information and links on our church website. The monthly UUCR newsletter comes out the first of every month by email and per request by postal mail. If you have something you would like covered or that you want to write, let Dinah know at ramblinrose22 at yahoo.com or call or text her at 2 lightings of sacred flames. The first is the Occupied Indigenous Peoples Remembrance Candle. The second is the lighting of our own chalice, the symbol of our faith. Let us acknowledge that we walk upon the traditional territories of the Maranga, the original people of this land who continue to cry out for justice and self-determination. In honor of the Maranga people, we, the Universalist Unitarian Church of Riverside, light this sacred flame as the stewards of this sacred and holy place. We are blessed with a space and opportunity to strive to live out our common principles to bring justice, equity, and compassion into our daily lives, to resist all, all that threatens the earth and her people, and to live out our dream of a world community of peace, liberty, and justice for all. Let these thoughts carry us forth as we journey and worship together. Our chalice lighting this morning is Blessed is the Fire That Burns Deep in the Soul by Eric A. Heller Wagner. Blessed is the fire that burns deep in the soul. It is the flame of the human spirit touched into being by the mystery of life. It is the fire of reason, the fire of compassion, the fire of community, the fire of justice the fire of faith. It is the fire of love burning deep in the human heart, the divine glow in every life. Our next hymn is Spirit of Life. Please rise in spirit and join us.
Sharing joys and concerns is an important part of belonging to this beloved community. On the first Sunday of each month, we will share with you the joys and concerns that we have received throughout the month. Please be sure to share, to email, or text your joys and concerns throughout the month to Dinah Rowe, our Caring Network Coordinator. You can call or text her at 909-645-2885. There's a Swedish proverb that says, shared joy is a double joy. Shared sorrow is half, half sorrow. Although the tradition is rooted in many societies, Throughout history, after battle, the warriors gathered around a campfire and talked about their wins, their losses, the valor they witnessed, the bravery. It helped them cope, survive. Today, critical incident debriefing techniques and many forms of therapy include a sharing of joys and concerns by whatever name. Joys, gratitudes, thankfulness, concerns, worries, morning losses. And isn't that what close friends do? It brings us closer. On first Sundays, we place a symbolic stone in our water chalice for the joys and concerns we have shared and in recognition of those we hold close and have not shared. I have a concern shared with me by Carolyn Verville Johnson from Sunshine Haven Wildlife Rehabilitation, a previous speaker and 50-50 recipient. Her husband, Craig, was diagnosed with pancreatic cancer in April. He's at home receiving chemotherapy. Carolyn is having a great deal of difficulty coping with the slow but inevitable loss. She's been close to the opening of Sunshine Haven at Louis Rubido Nature Center, but Craig was always an integral part of this project. And so opening has been difficult in many ways. Pat Cowunder's husband, Ted, passed away at home during the night in, of November 20th. Gail Wood Woodbury tested positive for the COVID virus and is hospitalized. We place a symbolic stone in our water chalice for the concerns shared and in recognition of all those held close and not shared. Janice Levi will be 100 years old on December 20th. Happy birthday, Janice. We wish you many, many more. That is, it is said that joy shared is multiplied. We place a symbolic stone in our water chalice for the joys we have shared and all those we have not. And now Dinah Rowe, our church treasurer, will speak with us about sharing our treasure. Good morning. This portion of our service is how we fund all that we do to care for our congregation and our beloved historic church, and to ensure that when we are able to safely reopen again, we will be here to welcome you all back. In normal times during the holiday season, in the months of November and December, we would take collections during church services to assist with food and gifts for those less fortunate. Less fortunate. We called it SOS, for sharing our spirit. As an offshoot of the recent CARES grant the church received, 
The, ta the task force has continuing, is continuing to take collections for food items and gifts for members of the Riverside community. This will be an ongoing project, not just during the holidays. If you would like to help with this ongoing event, send a check to the church and market food pantry or gift items for Operation Safe House and the greater community during the holiday season. You can mail your donation and your pledges to the church address. Please, no cash. Our church office, will, church office address will be shown a little later. We, we have Stater Brothers cards for your grocery shopping that also earns our church a percentage. Please contact me or Robert in the church office uh, to purchase Stater cards. We currently have about $1,100 in Amazon cards also available. If you would like to purchase these Amazon cards uh, for gifts or for your own personal use, contact also contact Robert. Remember to be sure to have the word smile. Type in smile.amazon.com when making your purchases. Be sure to have smile and choose Universalist Unitarian Church as your charity. We receive 0.5% of your qualifying purchases. And by using an Amazon script card, we receive a percentage from both. Gift cards make good gifts to put in your holiday cards. Please donate by whatever method works for you. Thanks for your generosity and to those who give of their time and their talent. Thank you for your generous care and attention. Our next hymn will be from you I receive. Please rise again in spirit and join us and we will sing through this three times. Thank you, Dinah. Our contemplative reading this morning is The Miracle in the Mundane by Kyle Johnson. O oh, spirit that moves in all things, great mystery whose reach spans beyond the cold distant edges of our universe and yet is present within the vast subatomic emptiness, coursing through every fiber and every breath of our being and through being itself. Help us to see the miracle in the mundane, to see the crystal stars, the shape shifting clouds, the patient trees, to see each other through fresh eyes. For it is so easy to forget, to forget what we truly are and what we've been given. As we move through our lives, let us remember to see through the mundane to the miracle beneath and to perceive that common substance that gives birth to our myriad forms, that mystery that spans beyond the edges of the universe and yet infuses our next breath. And let this foundational awareness guide us on our paths as we work towards peace and fight for justice while always informed by a spirit of compassion. May it be so, amen. Now let us pause to share a moment of silence.
And now I'm happy to welcome Kathy Nichols to our virtual podium. Kathy? Um, the the um, presentation I have today is, is Invitation to a Treehouse, Exploring Compassion. And I want to wish everybody a good morning and welcome to all that are present this morning and any who have found us while scrolling. At this point, if you've, if you had noticed the title slide. I don't, that was before, but you may be asking yourself, what does a tree house have to do with compassion? Well, quite a lot, actually. The two are connected by an experience I had while working in downtown Los, Los Angeles in the early 90s. As I drove in off the freeway into, the, into downtown, Generally, there were street vendors on the corners or on the islands selling bags of cherries or big, big bags of oranges. Frequently, I would buy the fruit and give out oranges as I walked to my building. The people that I gave the fruit to at that time were the daylight people. When I left work, it was dusk or dark, and the street people were pretty spare, sparse at this time. On the corner across the street from the freeway entrance, there was, however, a woman who was there every, every night in the same place. After about a week of driving by and giving her oranges and a little bit of money, I had just started the job, so little money, we would chat. And while I waited for the light to change, uh, and chat while I waited for the light to change, we were on a first name basis after a while, and I would buy extra at lunchtime for her and some money. Not long after that, that I asked her if there were things she needed. So after that, along with the previous items I brought, I included toilet paper and feminine hygiene products from home. At that point, it was sort of like talking over the fence with a neighbor. We talked a bit about our lives and present circumstances. It was a long and metered light, so we had plenty of time to do that. I told her about my near fatal car accident and how I was having difficulties with the job. This was before I knew that I had a brain injury. I could not perform as I did before, so they were not happy about my production levels. She knew I was anxious because I was staying with friends on a rotating basis so as not to be homeless. One late afternoon, I was called in and laid off. So that night I drove up to talk to her and to tell her what had happened. I still had some lunch to give her and $20 because I would not be coming by anymore. And this is what she said to me. Well, I'm sorry about that. I will miss our talks and you must be scared. You see those bicycles under that tree next to the freeway? My man fixes the bikes and sells them, so we do okay. Now, if you ever need a place to stay, we have a tree house there too. You are welcome anytime, which stunned me. Um, we, we wished each other well, and I drove off crying. When I recall that experience, it always feels very profound, um, that her offer was profound compassion. And that is how a treehouse and compassion are linked. Um, and obviously, it's still very present with me. Um, now, 
what I wanted to do is start, start talking about uh, compassion and different contexts um, and what the different contexts have to say about what compassion is in that context. And so, um, for instance, um, what is compassion made of? And that's part of the UU context that would be referred to in the second principle, justice, equity, and compassion by David Rico. Um, his, his quote was, compassion is love's response to pain. And another um, 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 quote from the second principle was Judith Hanson Lassiter. And that was from also from Worship Web says of compassion, there is no question for which compassion is not the answer. And Desmond Tutu said, no future without forgiveness. So there are some of these that are similar and then not exactly. So there's, there's different, different ways and different uh, that people consider what compassion is. So I also was curious about cultural differences um, because uh, during the last four years, I've been um, working with compassion almost as a meditation. And especially even in the last four years, it kept on begging the, the question for me of why do we seem to have so much... Uh, uh, <laughs> have no, not much compassion at all. And it actually seems like people are brutal to each other. And so I was asking questions like, uh, is, is, where does compassion come from? Is it cultural? Is it individual? Um, and then the big question uh, about that came also to me was, if it's cultural, um, what do we do as people that are advocates, that are social justice people? Um, how do we work in that context to create more compassion? Um, so one of the contexts that I thought uh, helped to understand, at least within uh, an African continent uh, 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 context was a concept of Ubuntu. And this is what, uh, it's kind of long, but it has all of these different subtleties about what that word means. And so Ubuntu is a com complex word from the Nguni language with several definitions all of them difficult to translate into English. The Nguni languages are a group of related languages that are spoken in South Africa, mostly Southern Africa, mostly in South Africa, Swaziland and Zimbabwe. Each of several languages share the word and at the heart of each definition though is the connectedness that exists or should exist between people. One meaning of Ubuntu is correct behavior, but correct in this sense is defined by a person's relations with other people. Ubuntu refers to behaving well towards others or acting in ways that benefit the community. Such acts could be as simple as helping a stranger in need or much more complex ways of relating with others. A person who behaves in these ways has umbutu. He or she is a full person. For some, umbutu is something akin to a soul force, an actual metaphysical connection shared between people and which ha helps us connect to each other. 
Umutu will push one towards selfless acts. So then they, they, it also started to uh, kind of morph into also a philosophy. So the philosophy of Umutu uh, started during the era of decolonization. Umutu was increasingly described as an African humanist philosophy. And Umbutu, in this sense, is a way of thinking about what it means to be human and how we as humans should behave towards others. So we can see that at one point it, it kind of was a microcosm, and then it's it, this one has turned it started to come into a philosophy and uh, it started to develop different meanings. Um, that were more macro. So, so um, let's see. Um, so uh, Umbutu in the sense is a way of thinking about what it means to be human and how we as humans should behave towards others. Archbishop Desmond Tutu famously described Umbutu as meaning, quote, my humanity is caught up is in, inextricably bound up in what is yours. In the 1960s and early 70s, several intellectuals and nationalists referred to Mbutu when they argued that an Africanization of politics and society would mean a greater sense of commun communalism and socialism. And in, um, so, at the end of apartheid in the 1990s, people began to describe Umbutu increasingly in the terms of the New Guinea uh, proverb translated as, per, a person is a person through other persons. Um, a scholar Christian Gad had speculated that the sense of connectedness appealed to South Africans as they were turning away from separation of apartheid. Mbutu also referred to the need for forgiveness and reconciliation rather than vengeance. It was an underlying concept in the Truth and Reconciliation Commission and the writings of Nelson Mandela and Archbishop uh, Tutu raised awareness of the term outside of Africa. And President Barack Obama, when he was president, included mention of Mbutu in his memorial to Nelson Mandela Della saying it was a concept that Mandela embodied and taught to millions. Um, and then there was a story I, I uh, found as um, I was doing some of my writing and it started off at, uh, like this. Um, an anthropologist invited children from Af an African tribe to play a game. He placed a bowl filled with sweet fruit by a tree. He addressed the children saying, the one who gets to the tree first will be rewarded with all of the sweet fruits. When he signaled the children to start the race, they locked their hands together and ran toward the tree. They sat down at the tree together and shared the fruit. The astonished, of course, anthropologist asked the children why they had run together when each one of them had the opportunity to have all of the fruit for themselves. The children replied, Ambutu, it is possible, is it possible for one to be happy when everyone else is so sad? Ambutu means I exist because we exist. What, so what, what does this story say about compassion? And it says many, many things. So, and it's used, some of it is, is not exactly com, a common way of looking at compassion in our Western civilization. At least that's my, opi my opinion. Um, so, um, another, um, Another context uh, for uh, 
the principle of compassion is uh, from Karen Armstrong, who is a um, pretty famous uh, Christian scholar. Um, and she started, I think it was in the late 80s, um, an organization called Charter for Compassion. And I wanted to read their uh, charter um, because I'm, I'm actually working towards, uh, well, I'm, wor I'm working up towards something. So um, actually how uh, compassion is, um, it's, it's becoming looked at and, and integrated in, in um, many different organizations um, that are trying to um, bring compassion um, to our, uh, to our um, to people and to, to help them uh, learn about compassion. And it is uh, finding its way into um, like uh, actually urban planning. They have a charter for compassionate cities. Um, and um, so um, I, find, I found it interesting that, that all of these different things that used to be silos are sort of being looked at as systems. And um, before, like, especially like in urban planning, you wouldn't have an, a, a planner going, okay, now, you know, how are we going to build compassion into the city? Why, you know, or how, um, how do, you know, even thinking about a compassionate city, because a lot of times that uh, before urban planners would even forget that, that there were cities had people in them and they, um, they planned for cars. So I find this trend very possibly hopeful. So the Charter for Compassion that uh, what is the principle of compassion lies at the heart of all religious, ethical and spiritual traditions, calling us always to treat all others as we wish to be treated ourselves. Compassion impels us to work tirelessly to alleviate the suffering of our fellow creatures, to dethrone ourselves from the center of our world and put another there, and to honor the invaluable, invaluable sanctity of every single human being, treating everybody without exception, with absolute justice, equity, and respect. It is also necessary in both public and private life to refrain, refrain consistently and empathetically from inflicting pain. To act or speak violently out of spite, chauvinism, or self-interest, to impoverish, exploit, or deny basic rights to anybody, and to incite hatred by denigrating others, even our enemies, is a denial of our common humanity. We acknowledge that we have failed to live compassionately and that some have even increased the sum of human misery in the name of religion. We therefore call upon all men and women to restore compassion to the center of morality and religion, to return to the ancient principle that any interpretation of scripture that breeds violence, hatred, or disdain is illegitimate. And um, also in the Torah, yeah, that's also a it's well, that's another thought uh, and principle in the Torah about uh, not mistreating animals and um, and that that's against that's against the law, the Torah law. And um, to ensure that youth are given accurate and respectful information about other traditions, religions, and cultures, to encourage a positive appreciation of cultural and religious diversity, to cultivate an informed empathy 
with the suffering of all human beings, even those regarded as enemies. We urgently need to make compassion a clear, luminous and dynamic force in our polarized world, rooted in a principled determination to transcend selfishness. Compassion can break down political, dogmatic, ideological and religious boundaries. Born of our deep interdependence, compassion is essential to human relationships and a fulfilled humanity. It is the path to enlightenment and indispensable to the creation of a just economy and a peaceful global community. So again, I approached my presentation in this way because I wanted to share a sample of meanings and contexts of compassion. Um, and in the writing of this, again, I, I started to uh, use the concept of compassion as meditation. And over the last four years, especially, um, I, can, I considered it very important. And I started asking questions. Um, it, this has kind of been a, a bit of a journey because I, um, I've been trying to figure out how do we do good work? How um, do we um, really able to uh, uh, have equity uh, in a, a more lasting way? Um, is there a way to do it so that it doesn't change every time we have somebody different uh, in the government? And so I, that's why I've been, I've been thinking, well, okay, Compassion seems like, okay, compassion seems like something that could be a seed that would be relevant to other things. So I was asking questions like, why is it, why is compassion important? What effects are there when there is a lack of compassion? Why do some people have it and others do not? What does compassion, why does compassion seem to be built into some cultures? What is the intersection of compassion and the desire for social justice and equity? If there is a lack of passion and culture plays a part, do we move forward? I have found these questions are being asked in organizations, applying them to, to the health of cities. The Charter of Compassion, again, as I said, has a cha chapter for compassionate cities. They've also uh, encouraged people to sign on to the um, charter. Um, so over the last few years of working on my compassion meditation and specific questions, um, I have found that these questions are being treated as systems instead of silos. And the shift is giving hope to bring forward avenues to equity, social justice, environmental issues, and systemic racism. And I'm going to end with um, uh, something that's not necessary that is about hope, um, which may be part of what I do on uh, January the 17th. We don't know yet, but uh, Arundhati Roy said, quote, another world is not only possible, she is on her way. On the quiet day, I can hear her breathing. Thank you for listening. And I hope you found uh, some of this thought provoking. And um, thank you very much for uh, having me here today. Thank you, Kathy. <clears throat> and uh, yeah, I knew she was going to have a lot to say, and that's why we ha do have her scheduled in again in uh, January. J Kathy has also agreed to stay with us for a few minutes following the service for questions and discussions. So um, those of us who are on Zoom, uh, hang around after the service. Our closing hymn is We'll Build a Land.
please rise in spirit and join us. benediction, please close your eyes and reach out to each other in your thoughts. Feel the connection between us, the interconnected web joining us as a community, a church family. Our benediction is Go Forth in Simplicity by Samuel A. Trembori. Go Forth in Simplicity Find and walk the path that leads to compassion and wisdom, that leads to happiness, peace, and ease. Welcome the stranger and open your heart to a world in need of healing. Be courageous before the forces of hate. Hold and embody a vision of the common good that serves the needs of all people. Amen, shalom, and blessed be.
Thank you for the lovely service. Hi. Yes, thank you, Kathy. Thank oh. you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Compassion is a perfect topic <laughs> in these days and times. Yes. I'm, I'm glad you found it relevant. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I really have been, been poking at this for, you know, very intensely, I guess, because it, it pops into my head even when I'm walking is, you know, um, uh, about, about compassion and trying to figure out, you know, if that's kind of a key. But uh, any questions? Oh, by the way, um, I, I want to pr uh, provide a, a um, reference, you know, a, a list of the references I used uh, for this. Um, and just in case you're interested or you're, you know, and to be, to be giving credit to uh, the folks that I, that, um, that I uh, got, had inspiration from, so. <laughs> Kathy, I had a question. Um, okay. I, I, my name is Grace, and um, I was interested in how you came to the um, cultural aspect of with the African, the African background, is that what you were, the, the word that you used? Ubuntu. Mm -hmm. um, I'm still not sure I'm pronouncing it right. We tried to double check before I came on and uh, it wouldn't give us the, the audio. So, um, well, um, all my life I've, uh, I've been interested in all kinds of cultures. Yes. And yes. Um, I, I, I'm, I'm yeah. getting, yeah, Jim, Jim, yeah. um, getting. am I supposed to turn myself off? No. Oh, well, anyway, I'm getting some feedback. Um, and I've, uh, I've always had a lot of friends from different, uh, different cultures, um, I went to UCLA, so we had a, a lot of, you know, I was around in my classes, Iranians, Africans, uh, Japanese, Chinese, Filipino, um, and then um, um, also I, um, when I was at, uh, I went to Syracuse and finished off my degree and um, my minor was in the international relations um, government, which was funny because my, you know, my, my, uh, my major is, you know, uh, the hit, um, music and art history. Um, but we did a lot of, uh, a lot of work around international relations and they tend to, um, you know, talk about different areas and what's going on. And I did a paper on um, comparative, it was comparative uh, um, truth and reconciliation movements um, between, I think it was uh, Peru and it was from what was going on with uh, the anti-apartheid things. And so um, I just, I'm always looking at, uh, well, what's the culture? You know, uh, what, do they, what do they do? And especially I do that because if I run into somebody a lot of times, it makes it easier to, to uh, um, create rapport. Um, so I always kind of keep little things in my mind uh, when I hear things about something cultural. So if I run into somebody, I could say, oh, you know, and then they usually brighten up because it's, they're being recognized. Um, is, does that kind of give you an idea or you have more, more something that's more in academically or something? No, absolutely not. That that was that answered my question. And um, 
it was what stuck with me was that image that you said about how the children joined TAM and, and ran toward the reward. Um, that's probably almost unheard of in America, <laughs> uh, <laughs> where like people will shoot out and yeah, just I know. grab it. It would be like, you know, what is it, Black Friday, where they all go in <laughs> and they, you know, LB, elbow each other out. Yeah. And, yeah. you know, so that's definitely, you know, I mean, that's cultural. The, the, um, the, the lone um, um, hero, you know, like the Marlboro Man or whatever, and pulling yourself up by your bootstraps and, you know, don't let anybody get in your way. And, and I, especially after uh, this last um, administration, it, you, it, it's toxic. It's just so incredibly toxic. Um, there was a, um, Let's see, who was the guy in MASH, Joan? Uh, Alan Alda. Yeah. Alan Alda, uh, yeah, way back, I think it was in the mid 70s, wrote a piece. Now, this was like record breaking. Wrote a piece in one of the major newspapers and, you know, paid for a whole page and talked about toxic masculinity. And, um, it, you know, there's just, and the thing is, is there's a lot, it's so layered, especially now, you know, at this time, because there's been like 200 years of all of this lay, layering of different types of oppression and, and that in the institutional <coughs> racism and sexism and, and everything. So that's why I find it kind of complicated because how do you, I mean, do you, are you able to peel off one layer at a time or do you have to be really uh, like a blitz and kind of like <laughs> blow it up? You know, um, it just seems like, I mean, I've been, I was doing uh, social activism stuff like well, for a very long time. Um, and uh, we're still here. <laughs> so I think that's why I've, I've been worrying over it, you know, trying to figure out, you know. So anyway, any more questions? I think Pat Quander is trying to ask a question. No, actually, I, I wanted to make a comment. Um, ah. I just thought it was fascinating as a psychologist that on the, like the TAT, which is a, a psychological test where you make up a story about a picture and the Rorschach, there are ways to measure competition and cooperation. And I found that in my work, people with a, a reasonable score on cooperation in both these were so much more amenable to therapy because they knew how to receive and give help. They recognized that as a, as a real thing. Yeah. And so I always thought that was amazing um, that we never taught that more, more directly. Okay. But it's something that I watch for in, um, when I meet people, are they capable of giving and receiving help? Are they capable of cooperating and supporting right. rather than you know, if, if you tell them about a success of yours, do they enjoy it or do they tell you about their bigger success? Right. Or, or if there's a lot of resentment, if all yeah. of a sudden resentment starts popping up. Yeah. Um, there's, there's another part of this that, that I'm, that I, I haven't quite figured. Out. Well, I think one of the reasons why I was so stunned um, and I'm, I write, I, you know, I, I am upset with myself because I can't remember the woman's name, but it's been years. So, but, um, the fact that while I, while I sat there and talked to her, I'm watching cars go onto the freeway and, um, you know, it's downtown Los Angeles. So you've got Porsches, 
and exotic sports cars and all manner of, you know, uh, showy um, consumerism. And, uh, <laughs> and they all have these very dark tinted windows. You, you can't even see them. And when, you, when they would see somebody on the ramp with a sign or something, they, they would edge up and edge up and edge up. They couldn't get out of, away from that person fast enough. And when the, um, the Mexican guys, um, you know, in the pickup trucks and, and, and uh, lawnmowers would come up, they would roll down the windows and they would, you know, hi, how are you doing? You know, and they would, you know, give them some money or they would give them some food and, you know, they would treat, they would greet them like a long lost friend, you know, it's like, I'm, you know, take care. And, you know, um, and so I thought, you know, it's, that's kind of strange. Um, and so I did find, out but I kept on checking and checking to see if there was because I was a psychology major way back when um the psychology today had uh started to have articles about the biochemistry the brain chemistry and um what the difference is in the in the brain either you know different um what do you call them? The different, I can't remember, but. Um, Synapses, neurons. Yeah, the little, the little, you know, the hypothalamus <laughs> and, you know, all the little organs in there. I guess. And they said that there was people who had empathy um, had a certain uh, shaped, and I can't remember right now, but it was the I don't remember. I have to find it because that's one of the things I was looking at. But, um, and then if you were rich, that there tended to be different formations in the brain. They looked different. And I thought, dear God, if that's the thing that we have to fight against in order to try to get more empathy and equity, how do how do how do we approach that you know it's like i'm sorry you know you don't have the right chemistry in your brain because you're selfish or something you know i mean then that's just really going to a place where it's like what do you do with that you know <laughs> uh, <laughs> so, <laughs> you know um so that made me a little that kind of that kind of you know I, my knocked the air out of me a bit and I, th I thought, oh my God, you know, for activists and stuff, what in the heck are we going to, what do we do with that? You know? So yeah. And that's why I thought it was so, you know, so, a, so profound, such a profound gesture of compassion because I mean, you got all, all these people, you know, hundred, two hundred thousand dollars a year. You know, I can't be bothered. Got the, you know, the the gardeners, and you know, they're making it okay, but you know, it's really tight. And they go, oh yeah, sure, you know, my friend, yeah. Um, and she invites me at any time to come up and stay in their tree house, you know. And I was just like, wow. I think it's very relevant right now because of the gap that's increasing between the haves and the have-nots. And, you know, if that's true, if that's the case, then it's going to get more and more, you know, uneven, unbalanced. It's, it's going to really affect what's going on. Yeah, absolutely. And, and, and I mean, we don't, we're not, well, when I came back to California um, after being in, in uh, uh, upstate New York, and then when I came back in, uh, from Yuma, um, which was 2000 and, what was it, 2012, John, 2015? 
We went to Yuma in 2015. 2015. And uh, I drove into Orange County, uh, I think it was Tustin. And I was, I was born and raised in Southern California. And uh, right now I have a love-hate relationship with it. I'm in you know, Massachusetts right now for Joan's um, internship. But um, I'm, I, I had never, ever seen the LA River that went by Tustin. I have never seen it like that, ever. And I, I just, I could, I just couldn't believe it. And uh, I had lived in the valley a couple of times, and I went out there to visit a friend, and it, I was just, um, it's like, oh my god, you know. And nobody, I haven't been lucky to get a position with the regular hierarchical urban planning department so I have to figure out something else and and I'm just going this is this is we can't we can't be doing this this is we've got to do something about this so I'm trying to figure out how to uh, come up with a white some white papers and some studies and and work with the regional planning area uh, departments because uh, that's part of their purview and to get centralized food, food and, and, and uh, shelter and stuff like that, especially as quickly as we can, because with what's happening now, I just don't, I, I, it's, it's, it's just, it's tragic. It's, I don't even know what to call it. You know, it's heartbreaking and it's tragic. Um, so, um, I mean, when, when I had my accident, um, I was not sleeping rough, as the Brits say. Um, I had a, a good uh, network of friends, and uh, my mom wouldn't take me in, but my friends said, okay, Kath, you know, next week you go see Karen, and, uh, you know, uh, Susan has a place for you, you know, um, after I got released from the hospital. Um, so I, I am very, very fortunate that I wasn't out on the street um, because uh, it made it easier to, I've still never really come back uh, fully into, in, into the culture. Um, I'm still s sort of on the edge. Um, um, but if I, if I hadn't had those, those resources, um, I, I, I don't think I would, well, I definitely wouldn't have been able to go get my bachelor's and my master's. Um, my um, voc rehab counselor at um, um, uh, Cal State Northridge um, said, well, why did you, why did you pick this, you know, urban planning and a master's in public administration and urban planning? And I said, well, I didn't pick it. Uh, it picked me, you know? So um, I told her, I, I said, I was going to be homeless. Myself and my partner were going to be homeless. So uh, we were getting kicked out of a house, a friend's house. And she said, I have been a voc rehab person for a very, very long time. And I've never heard anybody use grad school <laughs> as a strategy for staying off the street. And I said, well, see, that's where I'm very fortunate. You know, I mean, no, it is, that's not what a lot of people could do. But that's how I stayed off the street. So, um, you know, when you're on the street, you don't have an address. So where are you going to get your paperwork and stuff sent? Um, you know, just all kinds of stuff. It's just, it's so multi-layered and, and uh, it's really cool because there's, there's a lot of things that are, that are happening that help. Like almost everybody that when I would go to social services uh, had a, a, a cell phone. 
you know, so that's kind of taking care of part of that, you know, if your worker's looking for you, you know, and you need to make an appointment, at least you have contact. Um, so I'm rambling, but you know, I, it, it's just things are, I it just, yeah, right now, I mean, you know, usually being an activist is, is pretty tough anyway. And with this, the one thing about it is, is it's, it's showing all warts and all uh, about our culture and uh, where the holes are and, you know, what we've been ignoring. And I think that's, it's, it's, uh, you know, I, I, it helps, you know, as far as that goes, it's, that's, you know, it, it's like right in your face and it's, and it intensifies more and more until you can't quite, you can't just go, I'm not going to pay any attention. So I think Tika has a question or a comment. Um, yeah, it's actually more of a comment. Um, I just wanted to, uh, Grace, like you were asking about the, you know, that culture uh, in the African uh, um, nation that she was talking about. Um, you find that actually a lot as in like Pacific Islander cultures where they are small little villages or small communities mm -hmm. in which their survival depends on each other cooperating together. Like instead of, uh, the, instead of going out to fish in the boats and bringing it back and selling it, they go out and fish and they bring it back and whatever anybody catches is equally divided among the village and all of the people there. And so when you, um, you know, when, and I think we had a lot in the past, more and more cultures were like that. Yeah. But as it's become westernized and we've isolated and we've specialized and, you know, that sense of I can do it myself, I, I don't need you. Yeah. Um, when that permeates our, the culture that we live in, then, you know, we lose that. And, um, and I think that's part of the frustrating part, especially for so many people now because of environmental, we all need each other to save the planet <laughs> and uh, people are not recognizing that and they are looking at their own particular self-interests. And so therefore, you know, I, I think that's a very frustrating piece of not recognizing that interconnected web um, yeah. and um, that we all need to be there for each other and for our planet. Yeah. That even comes down to wearing masks. Yeah. Yes. Right. Most, most definitely. Most definitely. Right? Yeah. Most simple. Um, yeah. There was there was a a story I heard on NPR. Um, it was a an economist that is uh, from South America, and he uh, was doing. Um, um, I think it was micro lending in South South America, and he told of a story that well he was actually more socialist. So, but he went back to to check on the people that he had um, um, given loans to, you know, and um, uh. There was a woman who had been, um, I think uh, uh, she did um, um, fabric, um, what do you call it? Uh, the um, making fabric. And um, she, you know, went out to the little markets and, you know, sold, sold the fabric that she made. And uh, when he, <laughs> he also was having to walk through mud, uh, barefoot. So he said that that was, you know, uh, his, his, his degree and, uh, his, his, you know, everybody rec knowing him, uh, was, was no good. So he said that was humbling. Um, but she, he said, well, how are you doing? And she said, oh, I'm doing fine. You know, we, we, you know, we, we 
the children are, you know, good and we've got food and, you know, and we can do that, um, you know, uh, three days a week and it's fine. And he said, well, you know, if you mechanize, <laughs> you could have more money. She says, I don't need more money. You know, now, now I have time for my family and my friends and we get to, you know, eat and, you know, together and, and our neighbors and, and he kind of went, you know, and so I was thinking, you know, how, how come some people don't have any concept of when enough is enough? It's like, how much money should only go to like, I don't know, five people. Why? You know, I mean, and Joan and I've talked about it and she said, I think it's, it's a, it's a hoarding problem. It's actually uh, the psychology around it is, is just a, a hoarding disorder. It's like, no, I never can get enough. Well, that hoarders can't get enough. You know, they, they're, they have this, you know, impulse. Like I knew a woman who had an impulse to pick up aluminum foil on the street in Baltimore. <laughs> so when I went to go visit her, cause I was going to help her get her cat spayed, there are these enormous mountains of tin foil, you know? And I thought, well, you know, it helps make her happy and it's not like it's really dirty in here. So I, you know, um, but anyway, yeah, I, I, what do you think, um, um, about about that uh, it, uh, being a psychologist, um, you know, as far as what the what the di does it seem like a, a hoarding disorder? Not being able to to have enough money. Did I lose my my psychologist? Well, you got two of them here. Oh, uh, one one thing that occurs to me on that is that um, uh. is that. Uh, it, it's built into um, capitalism. Yes. That, you know, you, you can't, if you don't every year show an increased profit, not just a profit, but an increasing profit, uh, as a CEO, you're going to lose your job. Yeah. It, it's part of our capitalistic society. And if you lose your job, you get a golden parachute. Well, there's that, <laughs> <laughs> you know, so they're, they don't even have an incentive to do a good job, you know, it's like, oh, yeah, you know, um, yeah, and that's what I, what, what I mean by it's so multi-layered. I find it so frustrating sometimes because I'm like, I just don't, I, you, hopefully, you know, we get to a point where you pull one thread and it starts to unravel everything, and, and the capitalism thing is definitely, a huge part of that, I think. Is this uh, is this a critique of capitalism? What is this? <laughs> no, this is a discussion of the service. Is yeah. this is this the um, chat time? No, no, it's in the other. Following the service. Should we should we go so that they can chat? Chat time or? has a separate link. It's oh. separate. I want to join the chat time. Andy, right now. Well, don't want to leave Tom all by himself. <laughs> He's all alone. Well, go, anybody who wants to join chat time can do that. No, okay. I know. I was just... Bye, everybody. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Kathy, it was great. Okay. Thank you so very much. Oh, um, yes, my pleasure. So really? We will be definitely seeing you. Um, okay. And if you want to join chat time, go to the website and there's a link on the homepage. Okay, thank you for the invite. I think I'm going to pass out now. So, <laughs> I, I I have a I have a stress around writing, so you know I yeah. So anyway, well, kind this of is your first time in the pulpit. You've done good. <laughs> oh, thank you, thank you very. Thank you for inviting her. Yeah. Thank you for inviting me. I really, I, I, I enjoyed it. So thank you. Thank you. It's nice seeing new, new faces that I, that I don't know when I was there. So everybody take care and uh, self-care, definitely self-care. 
and I hope to see you uh, in January, I guess. Right? Okay. I, I yes. I yes. And I think Joan's preaching what, at the end of the month? The end of, of December, yeah. December yeah. 27th, I believe. Yeah. Yes. So, yep. okay. Like, thank you very much. Thank you, guys. Okay. Bye. Have a, have a wonderful day if you can. <laughs> Bye. Yes, Bye. we all can, virtually. <laughs> yeah. Take care, everybody. Bye-bye. And I am going to be leaving also. So, bye, everybody. Okay.